Well, good morning to you all. Uh, thank you for joining me on this horological online discussion on John Harrison and the corpus chronophage. Um, I'm sorry I'm suffering a bit with hay fever at the moment, so uh, I have to excuse me sniffles every now and again. But firstly, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in the Portland nursing home in Buxton in Derbyshire, and the thermal springs there have been used since uh, Roman times for medicinal purposes, and they are all dedicated to St. Anne. I'm a Sagittarian, I'm over 30,500 days old, and my heart has made over 2.85 billion heartbeats. But I've had an upgrade with my software with a pacemaker. I like to call myself an inventor rather than just an entrepreneur. At the end of lectures, I'm usually asked, apart from a kettle cold troll and chronophage clocks, is there anything else that you've invented? Well, if you go to the European Patent Office site and under the inventor type in John Crawshaw Taylor, you'll get a list. It says approximately 440 of my patents. And I'll bring the actual little bit a bit closer and that's what it says so if you want to have fun you can go and check it out it seems to come up with a different result each time so uh, uh, about 440 so what what happened um, in my early life um, what else have I invented and one of the most interesting projects that I was lucky enough to work on as a young man was with Jaguar cars. And Sir William Lyons moved Jaguar cars from their uh, dated XK120 to 150, looking back to the pre-war design of sports cars, the traditional English sports car with the radiator at the front with a mascot on top of the radiator like uh, Rolls-Royce or Jaguar and you can see how he designed himself the long low lines of the of the, the car stretching right down to the bonnet and instead of having the, the tall high radiator it was a cross flow radiator a new concept to keep the uh, aerodynamics of the car very very good and so you can imagine the fun that I had designing the electrical cooling fan necessary for this job. And imagine me as a 22 year old going around the race track, high speed track at Nuneaton, and then the final test of driving up Porlock Hill in Devon, which is the longest, steepest hill, at about half past four in the morning when there was no other traffic and we had to drive up absolutely flat out and then when we got to the top go along at walking pace into a traffic jam as being the worst condition for all the heat have been building up going up the hill and then no through flow from the motion of the car entirely uh, cooled by the cooling fan and that was great fun so after career of designing controls, how did the corpus clock come about? Well, it was in a doorway that you can see there, and the planning permission for the library behind had been turned down because the architects had left the door um, as being part of the listed building and the planning committee said oh no 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 you can't uh, uh, have the the doorway and after a lot of uh, problems wondering what they were going to do and the fellows uh, kept on saying what they didn't like um, I said well why don't you have a clock there and the fellows said oh that's a good idea yes we'll have a clock so I said I'll design you one and that's really how it all came about. So how do you start thinking about how to design a clock when you're an inventor? 
and I decided I would make a tribute to my historical hero, John Harrison. And amongst his many inventions is bimetal, and of course bimetal has been the centre of my life for over 65 years. And he is best known for inventing and perfecting the first clock in the world capable of going to sea to give accurate time to find longitude. So in the background of this uh, painting, you can see the, uh, the, his pendulum, which is temperature compensated. And then on the other side, you've got the, his H1, the great big C clock, which actually um, met all the requirements of the longitude prize. But Harrison, uh, to a certain extent, was his own worst enemy. And even though he had met the requirement, he told the longitude board he could make them a better clock. And he then set about and made um, H2 and H3, neither of which he felt was correct. And um, he, he was suffering from uh, disease of inventors. If you can't make it work, make it complicated. And these clocks got more and more complicated and didn't cure the fundamental problem. And so, whereas when he started his uh, work, long case clocks were much more accurate than a little uh, pocket watch, uh, he had a theory that the error in the C clocks came about because they had a second pendulum action although it wasn't a pendulum, it's these rotary arms or, or discs. And that the, the result was that it interfered with the gyroscopic effect of the moving parts. And the, the sea on the ship would be almost in phase with the waves. And that would then give an impulse to the, to the mechanism, either slowing it down or speeding it up. And so it was fundamentally, he realized, um, not a good way of actually proceeding. And he then turned his attention to miniaturizing his inventions. And he got uh, the premier watchmaker in London to come and work with him. And uh, Jeffries actually made the watch that he's holding um, for Harrison. Uh, to Harrison's design and that then was so successful that Harrison put all his uh, ingenuity and drive into making H4 which um, had uh, bimetal compensation and met the requirements uh, for the longitude prize and of course as soon as he presented the results the board of longitude changed the rules and said no you've got to make two of them and so he was about 75 at that stage and he had to set to and make a uh, second H4, H5 and uh, it too was very, very accurate. And although the Board of Longitude still say, oh, it was just good luck. Um, he appealed to the king who tested the, um, his watches, um, said that they met the requirements and overruled the Board of Longitude by going straight back then to the government, to do the uh, Houses of Parliament and the government and getting them to vote, the government voted Harrison, the equivalent of the Longitude Prize. The Board of Longitude actually continued and Harrison didn't win the prize as people seem to think. The, the Board continued um, trying to uh, find uh, other people who could uh, meet these requirements. And I think it's a bit like the four minute mile that until it was achieved, everybody thought it was an impossible um, barrier to, to get through. And I think it's the same with finding longitude at sea, that everybody knew it was very, very difficult and couldn't be done. But once Harrison had done it, then the clockmakers and watchmakers of the world um, started to try and improve on Harrison's design. Because I think Harrison, although he was a wonderful 
uh, spent incredible amounts of detailed time, um, a lot of his inventions um, just showed what was possible, but they weren't practical to be manufactured in, in volume. And it took people like um, Mudge, Arnold, and uh, other watchmakers to perfect what Harrison had uh, shown was possible. So here he is holding Jeffrey's watch and I'm entirely indebted to him for all my navigation in flying. And here I am in Reykjavik about to fly the Atlantic, navigating by GPS, which all comes back to accurate time, of course. But before Harrison could make a sea clock, he needed to have a land clock accurate enough to calibrate his sea clock. Because at that time, there were, of course, no time pips, uh, no phoning on the telephone to find uh, Marbell and get the accurate time. And so he had to build, the first thing he uh, had to do was build a clock on land, which would meet the requirements of the longitude prize. And uh, so he set about, he was a carpenter and what would be more natural than to make a wooden clock. And this is the first clock that he made with the gridiron pendulum. And he actually made two of them and he put one in his kitchen and one in his lounge. And when his wife out was out, uh, he would let out the fire in the lounge, uh, open all the windows and the doors to let the cold air in. And then he'd bank up the fire in the kitchen until it was sort of 30 C inside and the, the cold of uh, freezing air in the, in the lounge. And he'd stand in the doorway and listen to the two clocks and you could hear the, the pendulum swinging and then they started to go tick tock, tick tock. And he could immediately see which clock was gaining and which clock was losing. And then he actually adjusted the temperature compensation. So that it didn't matter how many times he heated one up or the other one down, um, they kept perfect time. And how did he actually check the time? Well, sundial, yeah, you, you can't use it. It's, it's not accurate enough because of the umbra and uh, penumbra shadows. And so he actually used the rotation of the earth. And uh, if you ask people how long it ta takes the earth to rotate, most people will say 24 hours. Uh, that's only an average time looking at the sun, whereas the sun is what we tell time from. Um, if you want navigation time, you want absolute time, which is sidereal time, and that's from the stars. And if you wa he watched a star occult behind a neighbor's chimney, and his son or an observer with him would shout, now! And he could look at the position of the pendulum and remember that so he could measure the time to a tenth of a second. And the earth rotates actually in 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.09 seconds. And that was his absolute standard um, by which he calibrated this clock. And inside um, is a grasshopper escapement. And I thought that would be interesting to make a feature of, but how could I find a new way of showing time? Because uh, most clocks are boring. You just see the angles of the, the ha hands. You just have to glance at them and you don't have to look to read the time. You, you, if you've grown up as I did as a schoolboy, then when the big hand was up here and, and the little hand was just gone past the bottom. It was 12.35 and 12.35 was lunchtime. And you had to recognize, you could recognize the clock in uh, a tenth of a second glance at it to see when the lesson was going to finish. So analog time has been around for a great long time. Then there's digital time. Everything is digital, you, you see a number. Well, a number to me is, um, doesn't give a picture. 
like a clock face does. And if you're running for a train and you know it's going to depart at 10 past 12, um, and the big hand is coming up to towards the hour, then you know you've got about 12 minutes to run and catch the train. But if you have to work it out and subtract the one time from the other, um, it's not quite so visual, is it? So I wanted something that was visual and different. And I had to invent a new way of showing time. And again, this is how the thought process went. Uh, a vernier is shown there is interesting because you can see the penny is about two centimeters um, in, in, on the, the measurement here, two centimeters. And the upper scale here uh, measured the, the, the centimeters, but Vernier invented putting a, a second scale in underneath. And you can see as it moves each millimeter, the line comes in line and it's obvious that you can see exactly the decimal point so that with a scale marked out in centimeters, um, you can actually read millimeters. And I'd wondered in the past what would happen if you changed that as a, a light uh, as to, so that lights came up and I could never think of a use for it. With the lights moving, of course, if it moves a millimeter, then it's running the whole length along the, the scale. And what would happen if you actually turn that round into a circle? You get this effect. So every second that it moves forward, it goes all the way around the dial. And then there's the clock coming to show what it would look like in a ghostly clock. So how could we then make a Harrison grasshopper um, into a feature on a clock? And this is an animation of the precision clock that Harrison made for himself. And the big red arrow there is pointing to the shadow of the teeth because the escapement is a recoil escapement and in, during the recoil you can see the two pallet arms with the little weights in them and so that in the center position the they overbalance and the weight brings it in line so that the pallet engages onto the tooth whereas as it moves round it then increases the angle of the pallet and so that when the recoil takes place and the other pallet takes over um, each one then just lifts away lifted away by by the weight and it's a, a lovely motion so I'll, I'll set it going but don't forget to have a look at the shadows to see the recoil and that's the recoil that allows the other pallet to lift away without any sliding fiction. So this is the first mechanism in the world designed to operate without oil. So look at the, the shadow here moving back at every click of the clock. And that releases the other power. So you can see the it comes in line with the swing of the pendulum and the approach of the pallet to the escape. And the, the last bit of motion actually turns the whole clock backwards and the pallet goes, uh, is engaged, but you can't have two pallets engaged at the same time. So that as one starts the recoil, it releases the other and the weight then takes it out of the way. And the little dampers uh, you can see on top of the pallet is just to slow down the balance. And, uh, to maintain the emotion within bounds. Wonderful notion, isn't it? So this was then the dream. Well, 
how do you turn a, um, a dream into a reality? So the, the dream was to use the escapement and the vernier to show the time. And I needed then to have a team to move the, the project forward. And who better than the engineering company in Cambridge I'd worked with developing all the test gear and uh, automation for making uh, a million kettle controls a week. And here's Stuart Huxley, who built the first prototype, a half size design. And look at the glum faces. It didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, there are two things an escapement has to do. One is to each of the pallets um, has to, from the swing of the pendulum, has to release um, the, what if in effect are the hands of the clock, the, the time mechanism, the slits in, in, in this particular case, to give the correct time. And then the escapement has to, on every swing of the pendulum, just give it a little bit of a nudge to keep it swinging or air resistance, it would just slow down and stop. Um, but with this, the huge escape wheel that you see here, it's all spring driven, just like uh, Harrison's clock, but you can stop Harrison's escape wheel by just touching it with a feather, as the torque necessary is very, very low. But to accelerate this huge escape wheel, the, the spring had to be quite strong. And as it went from the one pallet to the other, um, it worked fine with the recoil, but the impulse got more and more and more, driving it harder and harder. And this, the uh, pendulum increased in amplitude until, well, basically it was lashing itself to death. So it didn't work. And most people then say, well, it doesn't work. You can't out Harrison Harrison. So um, uh, no, this isn't gonna work. But I have a theory that if you have a disaster when you have an invention, if you can turn that disaster into an advantage, turn it round, instead of seeing how bad everything is, uh, well, everything else is working. So all you've got to do is find a way of correcting your error and turning that into an advantage. And my problem was that the amplitude of the pendulum continued to increase. So we control the amplitude. And if you can control the amplitude, you can then make the clock do tricks. You can actually make the clock run backwards. Well, clocks don't run backwards, do they? And so it changes it from a clock into modern art. And that was the uh, decision. And we made a full, next thing, we made a full size one um, and controlled the amplitude. And this was what the concept was to have all the lights um, LEDs and then in front of them a pair of slits to act as the verniers, uh, gold teeth for the escapement and the chronophage on top. And the LEDs are rather like the sort of mystery when we turn the lights out. Lovely spooky atmosphere, hasn't it? So a lot of the engineering is hidden away inside the chassis of the uh, chronophage. You can see the uh, wonderful teeth, the, the tongue, uh, the eye mechanism, um, the blink mechanism, the sting. All these things are hidden away in the, in the bones, the chassis. And the sting mechanism itself um, is interesting that it's made in, you can see three parts. Here it is in the up position with the one, two, three segments. And here it is in the down position. And you can see now the more clearly the, the three segments of the tail. So every quarter of an hour, the, te the sting goes up rampant like that, um, just to show um, he's not to be messed with this chronophage. So developing the light pipes um, brought the information from the 
back to the front and see here the light pipes being developed. Um, not quite such glum faces today. And this is the, now the full size clock. And this is the detail of how it all works. Here's the second moving, and it's driven by the spring here. With the spring. Then interlocks with the minutes and moves the minutes forward one spot. And then, of course, the hour it will link the hours and move it forward to the hour. And when the move is taking place, it's then locked on that map. final results that we achieved. So to change the concept of the drawing of the chronophage, I realized that a drawing is, is two dimensions and everything is in the plane of the paper, whereas of course the three dimension has things sticking out. And so instead of just needing a sketch, we needed a sculptor to actually create uh, my concept. And so I engaged uh, uh, Matthew here, and here he is in the depths of winter working on his uh, 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 clay model. And then he made it into, we approved that, and he made it into copper. And here you can see uh, Joan, because I wanted to uh, cover the, the copper um, in stove enamel because paint or patination um, has a very finite life and so that we were going to cover all the copper and the these uh, uh, cast stainless steel parts of the sting um, cover it all in stove enamel um, glass paint and that would last for a very long time Then the, you can see how the escapement melds from the animation from the actual clock back to the actual clock again. And I hope you can see then that the, it's a true representation of Grasshopper escape. And it does do recoil, and then it, so it's a no friction interface between the grasshopper and the escape. And then the big face that I had to design, um, I wanted it to look like the start of the universe, start of time. And nobody really knows what was before the universe or whether it was a start, but it appears to have had a big bang and at the Big Bang, I like to think that that's when time started as a wave going out from the center. And if you throw a pebble in a pond, you get the waves coming out as a circle all the way around. So I imagine time coming out into through the universe. But of course, if you throw the pebble into the pond, you get a splash. And so that's a re representation of a parallel universe starting as a splash. And of course that would have a different time base. So we then had the doorway in Corpus where the clock was going to go, which has a, a lovely arch top, uh, but the bottom is a flat step. And I thought they needed something to balance the, the shape uh, because the, the top is like a, a lovely oval picture frame, whereas the bottom um, is just chopped off. And to stop your eye sort of thinking, oh, it doesn't look right, um, I thought we needed something to balance it. And so that I thought we'd have a, uh, a graticule to another of Harrison's um, thought processes as to how he measured the, the swing of the pendulum to a tenth of a second, which I think I've explained. And so that the, the graticule itself has uh, the, the 10 marks in it. 
and it's like a Spitfire's wing because I like flying and we've got the shield in the in the middle of Corpus Christi. And here is Mike making them in the Isle of Man, making the, the pendulum. And so this is the spun stainless steel uh, pendulum. And then it's welded up and turned into a perfect sphere. And we had great fun then doing some engraving. As it's a tradition in horology to use doggerel Latin and and to have swirls everywhere so uh, first of all hidden in the swirls i hope you can see the my bimetal shape and then you've got the i o h they don't have a j in in latin and greek so that's short for john sartor well i'm sure you'll all like to be sartorially dressed which is well tailored so John Taylor Monam from the Isle of Man invented it in 2008. And that was then had to be engraved um, on the pendulum. And the shield had to be made for the, uh, the graticule with the gold pen pelican pecking their breast for the, for the, uh, for the young and the fleur-de-lis for the, the Virgin Mary because it's actually the College of Corpus Christi and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And here's the team. It's very easy to think that Rembrandt did all his own painting. Um, well he certainly didn't make the frame and stretch the canvas and size the canvas and do the background and do the figures, Rembrandt just came in and painted the faces and the hands. Um, but he then signed it and all the team behind him have, have uh, uh, never been had any recognition. Whereas here's the main members of the team and I think behind them are similar numbers of people. So something like a hundred people were involved in creating the Corpus Chronophage. And it's become the visitor attraction of Cambridge with 5 million visitors each year. And that eclipses King's College Chapel, which has for 600 years uh, been the visitor attraction in Cambridge. So now the Corpus Clock is the visitor attraction according to the uh, all the guides in Cambridge. And usually all the people stand on the corner, they used to stand on the corner of uh, uh, Bennett Street and look at King's College Chapel. Um, now they all stand on the corner of Bennett Street and look at my chronophage, except when something exceptional happens. And here's the Tour de France uh, going past the clock. And yes, everybody, strange, strange, is looking at the Tour de France. So the, the corpus chronophage was first of a series of four clocks, which I built. And the, the second was um, the midsummer chronophage, which started off life um, on Midsummer's Day in 2010. And then it went on tour and it was, it's been to uh, Saatchi and Saatchi Museum, the masterpiece in, in uh, exhibitions in London, uh, Science Museum, uh, to the National Museum of Scotland, and it's been all the way around. The, uh, Matt, the sculptor, um, wanted to patinate the surface um, and originally it was all patinated but uh, I always had misgivings that patination wouldn't last and unfortunately my misgivings came true. So it's been necessary uh, to stop the ravages of time and to change the surface of the patination uh, to sandblast it all the way and then do a new process using a vacuum deposition of 
titanium and the titanium can be then colored and it's a natural color it's like a, a ruby a ruby is always red it doesn't fade because it's been in the sunshine it still is the same color well titanium um, is a natural color so it, again it will retain these lovely colors um, for another thousand years and where more natural could we put it into for show is just around the corner from the corpus clock so that the two clocks could be compared and it was un unveiled in the lion yard uh, last year on midsummer's day and we've just passed midsummer's day so it was just uh, a year ago I never want to do anything that anybody else has done before and of course all clocks have hands and they're boring because you just glance at them and you know what the time is and so I had to think of this way of showing time racing around the dial with the seconds on the outside the minutes and then the hours and as each one changes it, it races around the dial to show time is racing away and this one was uh, conceived and built on Midsummer's Day 2010 and so that it's nine years old and it's been out on tour. Having got one chronophage within the Cambridge Environ, uh, we didn't know exactly when this one was going to be finished and so that uh, we had to find somewhere fairly local where it could be shown and what could be a better place than the Lion Yard. It's, uh, absolutely ideal in this public space with people all around and you've only got to see people's reactions to see how they appreciate it. I've literally stood amongst the crowds as they come and I've watched people, particularly in the mornings, they will walk along the mall and they stop dead in their tracks and then they reach in their hand, in their pockets, bring out the phones and start the videoing and the, the photographs and everything that goes with it. Overhearing the comments so far, I've not heard a single negative comment, which is very unusual, because no matter what you do in a shopping centre, you can't please everybody. But I've heard nothing negative. Everything's positive and people are taken aback. They're gasping because it's so beautiful. So the, the third of the um, insect beast clocks was a private commission in Houston. And the lady wanted um, a female beast, but an old female. And so that uh, she had to look, be look a bit dowdy, a bit worn out. Um, with a few cracks in her carapace, but hidden underneath the wings, um, she was to be beautiful. And so you can see the wings here hidden away in safety underneath her carapace. And she shows them um, every quarter of an hour. And here's her sting and teeth and tongue and a beautiful eye and of course a lady with lots of uh, eyelashes and she's now uh, in a private commission in Houston um, telling the time. And when I was considering a clock for my own house um, I thought it'd be fun to have a, a dragon so that instead of being an insect it was a, an animal and rather than having a, a galloping horse or a chasing uh, uh, 
Jaguar, I thought it'd be fun to have a dragon. And this is how we've ended up. Hello, I'm Dr. John C. Taylor, and I'm an inventor, and I'd like to show you my latest invention, the dragon chronophage. I've been doing business in China since the 1960s. I love Chinese culture, and so I thought what would be more beautiful than a chronophage as a dragon. The first chronophage clock is in Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, and it's become the visitor attraction since it was installed there in 2008. Most modern art is static, and people glance at it and then move on. Because the clock does something like that, stops and then starts again, it attracts people and they wonder what it's going to do next. Uh, did you see it blink? Did you see its tail move? Did you see the spines move? And then most important of all for a Chinese clock, he will present his pearl on the hour to show his beneficence and then takes it back again. So this is why it's called a chronophage because it eats time. And once it's eaten that minute, you can never get it back. The dial on the clock represents time starting with the Big Bang, and then time spreading out as a wave into the universe. The dragon itself was designed by Professor Long in Hangzhou Academy of Art. The materials of the dragon and the colors of the dragon are all designed to last hundreds of years. The dial, and that's made out of stainless steel, but it's covered in 24 karat gold. The lights are from LEDs. The whole clock is very energy efficient from an operational point of view. The accuracy of the clock is, is interesting because of course, when it stops as it's just done now, it's lost a few seconds. The mechanism then catches up and so that it's exactly right on every fifth minute to a hundredth of a second because normally clocks are boring, all they do is tell the time. But this one interacts with the people, and so that it attracts people to it, and they will spend 15 minutes watching it, which is most unusual. And so that it needs to be in a public place, um, and it will then draw crowds. So where would we put it? I have a, another hobby and that's building houses. And this was, um, I can't remember, it was the fourth or the fifth house I built for myself. And I thought it was probably the last one. So I'd try and make it um, extra special. I started off thinking I'd make a round house. Um, and then I thought, well, that's too easy. So why don't we make it an elliptical house? Because an ellipse is the hardest shape to create but with uh, modern CAD and CAM manufacturing, um, it's all possible. And so if you have an elliptical house, you need um, elliptical columns. And of course, columns are not straight up and down, that the Greeks and Romans had this emphasis where they, it's straight for about the bottom third and then tapers in. And even in the photograph here, your eye corrects it to be straight, and so it makes it look a taller column. But we had to do emphasis, not only in the width, but also in the depth. And that had never, never been done before and caught all sorts of problems uh, to the designers and the makers uh, to make it a beautiful shape. And there it is, I think we succeeded. And again, things like floors tend to be boring and I thought, well, why don't we make a floor that looks like a dahlia with all the tubercles coming up? See the dahlia, Does it, can you see in the shape of the floor? It tends suddenly, if you look through it, it comes up into a lovely three-dimensional shape. And 
that's really the end of the story of the chronophage. And it's not the end of my life, and I hope it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning, to paraphrase Winston Churchill. Make sure you have time in your life to have fun. Um, I've had a lot of fun. And every year that passes, the quicker the time goes, the older you are. Any time you waste, my chronophage will eat. And you can never get that time back again. So have fun. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, John, for that presentation. That was absolutely excellent. And um, yeah, that was superb. So um, really lovely. And I can't believe that Lion Yard was only a year ago. It feels like it could have been a decade ago. I so, advise it you wasted. Absolutely. So um, now's the time to hand over to Kristen Leith, who's going to um, curate the questions. Kristen. Thank you, Tina. Uh, I'm Kristen Leith. I'm the exhibitions curator for the John C. Taylor Clock Collection. And I have the pleasure of working directly with Dr. Taylor's Horological Collection and specifically working on exhibitions as well as programs like this one. Um, before we dive into your questions, I'd first like to thank Dr. Taylor for such a fascinating talk and uh, when I was writing up my PhD I lived in Cambridge from 2010 uh, to 2013 and I was also working as a research assistant for a professor at King's and every day I walked by the Corpus Chronophage and I was completely under its spell. I spent many an afternoon on pause in front of it uh, I may or may not have been procrastinating, uh, but I was figuring out how to read the time on its clock face and just watching it go, effectively watching time disappear from my life. So little did I know that I would be fortunate enough to work with the man who invented it just a few short years later. So I think we can all agree that it is such a privilege to hear about Dr. Taylor's inspiration for these inventions his process for making the chronophage series and that it's just a truly outstanding series of non-static sculptural clocks. It's not every day that we get to hear about how he conceived them and effectively reimagined a clock face in the way we tell time. Now, uh, I'd also like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we've had a fabulous turnout, and please note that you can submit questions, uh, which I see you're doing via the chat at any time throughout the Q&A, and I will do my level best to get to all the questions. Now, uh, we did have some questions that were submitted before the event, so I will start with those in the spirit of first come, first served. And our first question is from Michael, and it's a bit controversial. He would like to ask Dr. Taylor if John Harrison really made H4. And the question comes from looking at the sequence of the H1, H2, H3 series and the finally successful H4. And he would like to know uh, how much John Harrison's son had a hand in that invention. And if it is appropriate to give John Harrison all the credit for it. Over to you, Dr. Taylor. Well, I think I've dealt with some of those points before. Harrison is like Rembrandt. He was the head of a team that he certainly didn't make every bit of every clock himself. And in his portrait, um, he's pictured with a watch which was made by uh, John Jeffries from him. And the, is certainly his son became a watchmaker. Um, and I'm sure that he had some hand in it, but the design was done by John Harrison and it incorporated all his uh, new inventions. And the invention in the watch was to have uh, diamond pallets, which didn't require actually any oil. And within the collection, I have a clock, uh, sorry, a watch made by William Harrison which also has diamond pallets, which don't require oil. So that certainly, yes, his son, William, went on the, uh, the voyages with the, the various clocks, um, H4 and H5, um, to make sure that they were looked after and properly wound, um, because there were 
people who wanted Harrison to succeed, like his son, and people who appeared not to want him to uh, succeed, like the Board of Longitude. And it was a team that Harrison led, and I'm sure his son was part of the team, but I think the design comes back to uh, uh, John himself. Great, thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Peter, and um, this is more about aesthetics, I think. He would love it if you would explain the significance of the scrolled design that we, uh, I think he's referring to the scroll design on the engraving of uh, scrolled cartouches on the back plates often uh, of the pendulums of clocks. And he just wanted to know why, why you think the makers used this particular design? Um, well, I think that uh, it's difficult to explain why artists do things, but uh, it was a tradition in clock making to engrave and to do designs, and I like to try and carry that on into the chronophage. Great. Uh, the, next, the next question is from Chris, and he was wondering whether you considered using lignum vitae for the bearings or other parts uh, for your chronophage series. Um, yes, we did consider it, and no, we didn't use it. Because, um, <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, the world has moved on and you can um, buy beautiful ball races. And it's another of Harrison's invention was the caged uh, roller bearing. And so that he actually used caged roller bearings within his clocks. So they weren't, he moved on from the uh, plain lignum vitae to a caged roller bearing and we use cage roller bearings within the chronophage. Great. So uh, I have another question that was submitted by an email from Fran. And uh, Fran, if you're here, I think you'll appreciate that Dr. Taylor did speak to a lot of your questions. She wanted to know about the creatures and uh, how they're different and the thinking behind using these animals. And you touched on the dragon, uh, the mid, uh, let me see, the dragon, the Houston Commission, and the corpus. Uh, so if you could, could you elaborate a bit upon your choice of creature for the midsummer? Because you didn't go quite as much into that during the presentation. Well, again, it's, uh, it's not a definite creature. I, I try to make creatures which are, um, I will say, like a book. That if you read a book and read about the characters, you form your own idea as to what those characters are and uh, how, what they look like, how they interact, uh, and you develop that idea from the story of the book. Uh, you then go to see a film of the book and you think, oh, I wouldn't like that at all, because your idea um, is in your mind as to what the character is. And so particularly in the corpus clock, uh, is it a sea creature? Um, is it a land creature? Uh, does it fly? Or does it have vestigial wings? Um, you, you have to make up your own mind um, and even whether it's a, a friendly creature or an evil creature. And I hope that all the, the clocks have a little bit of that mystery about them that it leaves it open to the viewer to make up their own mind as to what they look like. That's what art's all about, isn't it? It's intriguing the mind of the viewer um, and then they've got to make up their own mind. I think you definitely achieved that. Now I can get to some questions that have come in on the chat. Uh, and the first one is from Chris Andrews. Uh, is the Chronophage series finished or will there be more? I've got my order book with me. If you'd like to place one, he can have uh, the number five. <laughs> it's just uh, contact the office if you have a request. Uh, our next question uh, is the chronophage, if the chronophage is powered by electricity, what happens with the power cut? It stops. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that but might be but it, it's, um, it's not like a, a good old fashioned clock that when you when it let 
when you leave it and it's a weak clock and you leave it for uh, seven, eight days, then after that, on the ninth day, it will stop and it will be all out of phase and it will take you about 15 minutes to get the strike back into phase and the hands back into phase. Uh, we now live in a modern age where this can be all sorted out uh, within the, uh, the synchronization method because I've said that the clock has to be accurate. Um, every person who looks at the chronophage, they either look at the time on their, their watch, if they, very few people have watches these days, but they look at the time on the watch or on the phone and compare the two. And um, I, I know that clocks have to be accurate and so that this, all the chronophages are linked straight back to the uh, National Physical Laboratory, um, to the, uh, the British Time Centre. And so that's why I can say that on every fifth minute, even if it's been playing the odd trick, then on every fifth minute is exactly right to a hundredth of a second. Thanks for that. And uh, your, your question about how is the timekeeping assured, I think Dr. Taylor just inadvertently answered that for you. So I hope, I hope that will suffice. Uh, we are now, it is, it is noon uh, by my clock. Oh. And um, yeah, I think there's still a couple of questions, Kristen, if that's all right, yeah. Um, this is, they're flowing in, if that's all right. Okay. Then, let's see, Marjorie uh, wanted to know, <laughs> this is funny, how is time being perceived during lockdown? What is your take on that? And how would you represent lockdown time in a clock? Mm. Would, you, would you choose a mythological fly for a second clock, perhaps? <laughs> um, well, I think in lockdown, you'd have to choose um, a dungeon with lots of chains and clankings to uh, signify the difficulties of life um, in a different place. And I think the representation of a dungeon is slightly what I feel about being locked down, even in beautiful Isle of Man, where uh, you have the most wonderful views out to sea, but, uh, uh, time goes both very quickly and very slowly. And I must admit, the older I get, overall, the faster time goes. But uh, I, I'm, it's another commission I'd love to undertake if uh, anybody would like a, a chronophage to represent lockdown. But uh, uh, yeah, we'll have to think about it. That was a great question. Um, this is interesting. Uh, how, this is from David, how do you view noon and successive political renewals of daylight savings time, uh, GMT Greenwich or Gindinia Mean Time? I hope I, g Gindinia Mean Time, I hope I said that correctly. Well, so do I, I haven't the faintest idea what it is. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm, uh, not sure that uh, summertime um, uh, is absolutely necessary, but I'm old enough to remember having double summertime. And for uh, two or three years, uh, it was an experiment by the government that not only did they move the clocks, um, spring forward, fall back, didn't just do it for one hour, but they did it for two hours so that we had double summertime. And um, as a young man, that was great because uh, it didn't get that dark till the midnight. It was lovely. Uh, completely different to, to uh, winter time. Um, whether it's necessary or not, it never affected me. I just enjoyed the, the long evenings. And uh, whether it's anything to do with cows or whether it's anything to do with children going to school, I don't think it makes the slightest difference because what you gain on the swings, you lose on the roundabout. So uh, <laughs> it doesn't make the day any different, does it? And I think we have time for just a couple quick, quick ones. Uh, what is the anticipated life of the LEDs? 
it depends how much you drive them and uh, the LEDs that are, are used in the chronophage are not driven hard um, so that uh, whereas people think they will last forever um, they don't um, but I'm sure that they last um, uh, at least uh, 20 years something like that but if you if you drive them hard then the the life goes down um, geometrically from the brightness and so that uh, we don't drive the, the the LEDs hard and we provide them with a heat sink and so that uh, they will last. So this is our final question um, and this is about the technology side of it. Is there a source uh, that shows the purely functional elements operating as, as they do in the videos uh, superimposed perhaps over the, the visual artistry and I was wondering what sources we we do have available for that obviously we have the videos um, and maybe we could think about providing some more um, yes um, it, it's possible to do all sorts of things uh, when you're in your 80s you've got time to do a certain number of things well whether it would be the highest priority I'm not quite sure but uh, the it's interesting to consider what you could do with um, making other chronophages with uh, galloping horses or chasing lions or um, cockerels, whatever you had uh, in mind. And, so I guess um, we'll watch the space and we will let you know if uh, we incorporate some of those ideas that have come up. So, um, Dr. Taylor, do you have any final words that you'd like to say before? Um, I close up the proceedings and hand them back over to Tina. No, I can only repeat, have fun. That um, I think you can see that the series of the chronophages has been a fun project and it's given pleasure um, to everybody who stands in front of the clocks and sees them. Uh, that they will be there like the Prague clock um, for a very long time because they are they are fun. The sculptures outside the Fitzwilliam Museum in, in Cambridge um, are by very famous people and they're changed regularly. Um, but you don't have crowds stopping looking at them. Whereas the, the chronophage attracts the crowd because it's modern art that actually does something rather than just pretends. And uh, it's a fun thing and it uh, amuses people. Very few people um, don't like it, but that's art that people do and they don't like it. Um, but it's have fun in life as well. Thank you so much. And just to say that um, we've just heard today, which is fantastic news, that um, the Luxury of Time exhibition of John's clocks, including the beautiful Harrison clock you saw, the long case clock, um, it's on display. Um, the exhibition was paused um, because of the um, social distancing, but as of um, July the 4th, um, around that time, so that Saturday, July the 4th, the exhibition is going to reopen and it's going to run until September 27th of this year, which is wonderful, which just goes to show, never call an exhibition the luxury of time. You never know what might happen. <laughs> Um, the Manx Museum, uh, we've just had word where the exhibition is, will be open uh, as of early July and I will put their website details into the chat. So just go ahead and look that up and you can visit www.manxnationalheritage.im for details on the exhibition and the museum opening. So thank you everyone for your time. It's been a wonderful morning and um, we've loved having you here. Um, just seen a lovely message from Olivia um, in South Africa. Um, I expect you're probably one of the furthest distance people participating. We've loved having you here this morning. Um, one of the aims of Dr. Taylor is to encourage interest in horology. Um, I hope that you found this talk very stimulating and certainly the feedback's been marvellous. And um, just to say that the chat messages are saved, so we'll be able to record them, look at them, and John will be able to review them after this 
call. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. This is a question from Yura. Uh, she would like to know, um, given the way the clock stops periodically, how is the timekeeping assured? Does it run a little fast the rest of the time to compensate or is there some other arrangement? Yes, you've got it exactly right. That if the clock runs and stops, then it has to catch up and it will probably run with an increase in speed of 0.9 of a second per second, so that it gains a second back every 10 seconds. And most people don't even notice the, uh, that the swing of the pendulum has gone faster from a second pendulum to a 0.9 second pendulum. And so that it quickly then, uh, over a few minutes, makes up any time that's been lost. And the next question is from Marjorie. She would like to know, why did you specifically choose a mythological fly for the second clock? Well, Marjorie, uh, I like to think of all my uh, chronophages as something like a, dis a description in a book of a character. And the description in the book doesn't give the full detail of the character and so you form your own judgment about the character in your own mind and this is what I want all my chronophages to be that, that they're not Walt Disney characters that you know exactly what it is um, it's it's got to be an enigma and people uh, enjoy then trying to decide whether they like it or they don't like it or it's good or it's bad, or even some people trying to say the corpus crodophage is evil and has been planted there by uh, evil people. Um, you can't please everybody all the time. And if it's talked about and people are deciding in their own mind uh, what it actually is, then that's what art is all about. Thanks for that. Uh, there's one more question. This is a question from Mina, and she would like to ask, how did you hang it on the wall, and how do you repair it if something happens? Uh, well, Nina, it's like everything else that you hang on the wall. You do it carefully. <laughs> you have to make sure that the wall is strong enough because the total weight of the clock um, is, is approaching half a ton, I think, from memory, uh, with all the, the engineering inside and the weight of the face and the stainless steel. It's uh, quite a heavy beast. And so that it's not hung on the wall on hooks, it's hung on a expanding hinge, like um, a, a door in, in a row of doors so that the door comes away from the kitchen unit so you can have two doors open at the same time and so that the the clock when you it, you unclip it at the side and then it moves out from the wall and then you can rotate it round and in that way you can get on the inside of the clock and on the front side to clean it um, and you can then replace any bearings which have gone or LEDs which may have gone and we service the clocks every year whether they need it or not it's preventive maintenance it's like a uh, 10,000 mile service for a motor car the everything needs uh, careful maintenance it, it's a moving object not necessarily in a very clean environment so that in uh, most places like a shopping center the people are tramping around there's escalators going up and down um, it's it's a, a dusty dirty um, air environment 
and so that things do need regularly cleaning but with uh, stainless steel yeah, coated with 24 karat gold um, with careful cleaning it'll last for a thousand years um, the same with the enamel on the uh, on the corpus chronophage and that will last a very long time as as the dragon whereas the titanium coating it's a natural color and that will also last uh, virtually forever and so the it's mounted on the wall on a hinge and the hinge comes away so you can service the mechanism each year. That was all the questions um, which I got. I've got some lovely comments and I would certainly like to thank all the people who've uh, so kindly uh, brought their comments and all of them have been um, interesting and kind so thank you very much indeed for attending and I've enjoyed giving the talk and I hope we can uh, meet again thank you